Well, good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us for our Louisiana Medicaid inaugural Lunch and Learn series. Uh, I want to give a warm welcome to all the colleagues for joining us online. Uh, I'll let you know that on this very first Lunch and Learn series, we already have reached maximum capacity, which is uh, 100 people are logged in online. Um, we will record this uh, series and uh, email out the link so those who weren't able to get in are able to watch it. And we will also email out all the presentations. So thank you so much for, for joining us. So uh, my name is Farm Quinn, the Chief Medical Officer for Louisiana Medicaid. And the whole purpose of bringing together this, uh, this series is so that we can go beyond just the policy wants and get to our providers and really make sure that we engage our providers who see our patients daily on the ground level and understand the, the, the frustrations that you go through. And this is an opportunity to, to educate you about the different uh, resources that we have and, and, the, and see an educational series. So today's Lunch to Learn series is going to be about opioid prescribing a provider update. So just some background data about the opioid epidemic. In the United States, the sale of opioid prescriptions quadrupled from 1999 to 2014. However, there's been no overall change in the amount of case Americans actually report. In 2012, there are 259 million prescriptions that are written for opioid pain medication in the U.S. And each and every single day here in the U.S., nearly 4,000 people initiate non-medical opioid use. About 580 people initiate heroin use daily. So among those who are heroin users, about 80% report that they started out by misusing prescription opioids. Clearly, the opioid epidemic is a big issue. And already the federal government is uh, uh, making mandates and uh, 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 guiding us in, in the direction. The DEA has already announced that in 2017, they will mandate a reduction in the amount of opioids manufactured by 25%. So we're going to have a quarter less opioids available out there, and we need to be proactive as providers, as doctors, as pharmacists, as nurse practitioners out there to, to understand the shortage. So how does Louisiana specifically rank for opioids prescribed? In 2013, Louisiana ranked first in the U.S. for portion of opioids prescribed per capita among all 50 states. And this map just demonstrates Louisiana being in the dark purple is actually more opioid prescriptions than the number of people in the state. So what is the impact of increased opioid prescriptions in the U.S.? Specifically, when you drill down and look at East Baton Rouge Parish, the overdose deaths equal homicide deaths. Overdose deaths outnumber motor vehicle deaths. And according to our East Baton Rouge coroner, 88% of overdose deaths are related to opioids. So when you look at the prescriptions, clearly Louisiana has one of the highest number of prescriptions, but how does that translate to overdose death? Here you can see Louisiana has a higher overdose death rate than anyone else in the deep south, higher than Texas, higher than Arkansas, higher than Mississippi. So where are people getting these opioids from? This is what the data shows. In the past year, among non-medical users of opioids, they were getting the prescription from a friend, a relative, or even from providers going to more than one provider. So what is Louisiana Medicaid currently doing? What's the status of what we're doing right now to combat opioid use? A number of things. We have non-opioid pain treatment options that are covered by Medicaid. These include Naproxen, ibuprofen, relevin, tartal, meloxicam, physical therapy is covered. Uh, there are some limited chiropractic services for those under 21 years old. We have excellent substance abuse rehab available um, and uh, the great work from our Office of Behavioral Health colleagues. Um, we have a wonderful pharmacy lock-in program. And this is really important because when your Medicaid patient goes to the primary care doctor, then goes to the ER, then goes to their surgeon, and each time asks for a different prescription, this raises a red flag. And that patient is locked into a single provider and to a single pharmacy. 
We are also one of the states to have a pharmacy monitoring program, and it should be noted that not every single state in the country has a pharmacy monitoring program. So we should all, as Louisianans, give ourselves a pat on the back for that. Um, it's a web-based. It collects prescribing and dispensing data to control substances, whether or not it's paid by Medicaid, other payers, or by cash. We have prevention uh, built in for prescription duplication, prevention of early resale, and as we mentioned, um, substance use for prescription benefits. Naloxone is currently covered um, as a, a prescription benefit of uh, Medicaid. So this is fantastic. These are great first steps, but it is not enough. Louisiana still leads the U.S. in this opioid epidemic. So how do we proceed next? How do we as providers, as doctors, as pharmacists, as nurse practitioners, and as dentists, how do we proceed next? So I'm going to, I'm going to turn you to this uh, statement that came from a Louisiana resident who is recovering from substance abuse. And this is her thought. She said, someone who genuinely cares about people, about their lives, is going to have to make the hard decisions. Those decisions will save lives. And another really drawing fact is, as myself, a, a physician is something that Tom Freed and our CDC director said. He said, the prescription overdose epidemic is doctor driven. And it can be reversed in part by doctors. So my challenge to you is together, working together, we can make Louisiana healthier and safer. So let's collaborate with health and let's join together. I'm going to introduce a panel of three wonderful keynote speakers. The first will be Dr. Randolph Roy, um, who is a pain specialist and uh, is the program director for the uh, pain program at uh, LSU, or Tulane. Um, Dr. Jim Hussey, who is the assistant director for the Office of Behavioral Health, and Mr. Joe Fontenot, who leads our pharmacy board. All right, thank you, thank you, Dr. I appreciate the introduction and, and the promotion. I'm actually the assistant program director, not the program director of the Pain Medicine Fellowship at LSU. I am uh, uh, work, work at the VA full time, where I'm the chief of pain medicine. And uh, I have, I'm adjunct faculty at LSU and work very closely with the Pain Medicine Fellowship there, as well as the physical medicine and rehabilitation residency. Um, I'd like to, to echo a couple of things that Dr. Kui did, did talk about. Uh, and, and the history of the opioid epidemic, I, I think she was very insightful in saying that uh, we as providers uh, are, have the responsibility to address this epidemic because, unfortunately, I think, I think we uh, also helped to create it, uh, not intentionally, of course. Uh, but this, this graph shows most of my uh, professional career because I finished my residency in 1996. And that was right around the time when we decided that pain was the fifth vital sign and that we had to treat every bit of pain. We were encouraged to write opioids and we thought that people would not, I, we, we thought that the percentage of patients who would become addicted was a lot lower than it actually, unfortunately, has turned out to be. Um, you can see here uh, the direct correlation with the number of uh, uh, opioid prescriptions or sales and uh, the death rate that occurred over the, uh, the uh, uh, 90s and uh, into the early 2000s. And, and you know, that, this, uh, in, the, in the mid 90s, that's when we began to have a long acting opioid available that became very popular. This is a slide that's more current from the CDC uh, showing the unintentional injury deaths uh, that occur in the United States. And as you can see, uh, from 25 to 64 years of age, uh, unintentional poisoning is, is the number one cause. And, and of course, uh, the vast majority of this is due to opioids. It's really very sad because we're, we're uh, losing people in, in the prime of their, their lives. Um, so the CDC recognizing this has come up with some uh, uh, a guideline that consists of 12 recommendations uh, regarding opioid prescribing, and I'd like to just briefly touch on each one of them. Some of them are, are, are not surprising and are rather intuitive, but some of them are, are quite surprising. Recommendation number one. Uh, Non-pharmacologic therapy and non-opioid pharmacologic therapy are preferred for chronic pain. And Dr. Kui discussed this 
to mention uh, several of the alternatives that are available, um, and, and many of which are, are covered uh, by Medicaid. Uh, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, corticosteroids. Uh, those are often used. Uh, SNRIs, mainly uh, not alpha as much as they could be, as well as anticonvulsants, tricyclic and depressant, topical agents, and teaching patients home exercise. Uh, that can be done in the physician office. Uh, and then there are physical therapy, massage, injections, acupuncture, chiropractic care, which I wasn't aware of, uh, that Medicaid did cover that. I'm glad that just we mentioned that. And uh, uh, as well as yoga, tai chi, and nerve stimulators. Even if it's not covered by Medicaid, you can encourage your patients to go to local community centers where they can sometimes get involved in programs like this. A recommendation number two before starting opioid therapy. One should, uh, uh, or continuing, I should say, uh, uh, one should assure that there has been clinically meaningful improvement in pain. And Dr. Quee mentioned this. We've started patients on opioids who complain of 9 over 10 pain. And then a year later, they still have 9 over 10 pain. And it was the opioid. We haven't really helped our patients in that case. And, then, and when that's recognized, the opioid, opioids should be weaned or tapered. Uh, recommendation number three, before starting and periodically during opioid therapy, clinicians should uh, discuss with the patients the known risks and realistic benefits. This is part of an opioid uh, agreement, uh, uh, or should be a part of an opioid agreement. A recommendation number four, when starting opioid therapy for chronic pain, uh, clinicians should prescribe immediate release of your not the extended release that started in the mid-90s and that helped us on to our epidemic. Recommendation number five, and this one's really important, and this one I think is something that the clinicians should really pay attention to. Uh, when increasing opioids, or if you have a patient who's already on uh, a high dose, that high dose would be considered 50, 50 morphine milligrams equivalents per day. Um, uh, that, that is the point at which a patient becomes uh, at, at significantly higher risk for overdose and death. Uh, certainly over 90 is, is not recommended. Uh, and any dose over 90 should be carefully justified. Uh, and if you have a patient over 90, you should probably strongly consider weaning that, that dosage or tapering it. Uh, here's a graph depicting the, uh, the increased risk of death with increased uh, uh, morphine equivalent daily doses. Uh, and you can see it rises markedly at 50 and then very much above 100. Recommendation number five. Uh, this, this one shocks everyone uh, at the medical school. I'm, 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 everyone is shocked when they see this. Uh, when they see this recommendation, when opioids are used for acute pain, three days or less will often be sufficient. More than seven days will rarely be needed. Uh, this, I think, uh, is counterintuitive to what uh, many physicians in practice are used to. Uh, typically, I uh, hear people saying I get 10 days, 30 days, uh, but, but these are the new recommendations. I think I failed to mention these recommendations did come out in the middle of March of this year, so they are new recommendations from the CDC. Recommendation number seven, the benefits do not outweigh harms with continued opioid therapy. Clinicians should optimize other therapies to work with patients to taper opioids to lower doses. Uh, so we should certainly focus on um, appropriate tapering uh, schedules and close monitoring when, when patients are on uh, There should 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 be uh, 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 checked closely. And the next recommendation, I believe. Uh, uh, um, well, they said, yeah, I'm coming to that. And the thing I'm thinking of, uh, recommendation number eight is considering offering naloxone, uh, especially for patients with 50, 50 morphine milli equivalents. And uh, as, as Dr. Quee said, uh, naloxone is covered by Medicaid. Recommendation number nine, 
recommendation number nine. Uh, and we have uh, our assistant executive director of the State Board of Pharmacy here who will probably talk more about this, but the clinicians should review the PDMC when starting opioid therapy and, uh, and periodically during therapy uh, ranging from uh, average prescriptions every three months. Recommendation number 10, during drug testing, at least annually, or certainly more often if you have suspicions. Uh, we want to check for uh, that, the, that drugs are actually being taken and that there is no associated illicit drug use, which would uh, cause an increased risk of overdose. Recommendation number 11, uh, we should avoid prescribing opioids in benzodiazepines wherever possible. This, this uh, perhaps uh, uh, more than anything, uh, uh, can result in a markedly increased risk uh, in fact, the FDA did add a black box warning uh, for the concomitant use of opioids and benzodiazepines just this past August. And recommendation number 12, uh, uh, clinicians should offer or arrange evidence-based treatment uh, for patients uh, with opioid use disorder. Uh, uh, and, and what this means is if a patient has, does have uh, a, a use problem with opioids, uh, um, then, then buprenorphine treatment or suboxone is probably indicated or may be indicated and they should see a specialist for that treatment. Uh, I want, we, we've talked a lot about opioid uh, uh, overdose and risk of death, but opioids do have many other serious side effects. Uh, which are listed here. Uh, I, I do have uh, some of those outlined in more detail, such as opioid use and depression. Opioids are associated with a markedly increased incidence uh, of depression, uh, sometimes double. Uh, opioid induced sleep apnea, uh, another uh, significant and common problem. And opioid induced hypogonadism. This is thought to be reversible, but nevertheless, uh, if a patient is on opioids, it does occur, and it is associated with uh, depression as well, so it's a compounding problem. Uh, that, I believe, uh, brings me right on time to the conclusion of my talk, and I thank uh, Dr. James Puffy is next. Thank you. I see I'm the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Paper Health, the Medical Director for the Office of Paper Health. Uh, I've been in the office since February, and really since that time, you know, we've had a lot of focus both nationally and state, the LDH and OEH on opioids. So I'm going to give you kind of an overview. I might try to yield some time because a lot of what I have in the slide presentation is at a higher level and has been covered already. Um, but I'll just repeat a little bit of the background. Opioid abuse and addiction is a global problem. Uh, somewhere around 36 million people worldwide may have this problem. In the United States, 2.1 million are addicted to prescription drugs. Another 517,000 are addicted to heroin. This is largely a prescription opioid problem. Louisiana overdose deaths has steadily increased in 1999. In fact, it increased fourfold. In Louisiana, the age-adjusted overdose rate is 17.7. Per thousand, which is 11 percent higher than the national average. And Louisiana, as Dr. Queen mentioned, is uh, one of the top 10 states. Actually, the latest information I have is it's in the top five uh, in terms of this issue. So, what are we doing about it in Louisiana? So, this will be a little bit of a uh, overview of our legislation, a couple of federal grants, additional Louisiana efforts. We'll talk briefly about some risk factors, uh, a little bit about screening, and some other recommendations. So in terms of legislation, uh, there are five I'm going to key on. Uh, Act 676 created a prescription monitoring program in 2006. It's very helpful uh, that uh, all those who are dispensing have to put the information into that registry for that prescribers. 
of any sort to have access to that uh, is very helpful and intended to help decrease diversion by allowing practitioners to understand who's been prescribed um, at these medications and who hasn't. The Loxo legislation in 2015 addresses best practices for storage, administration, emergency follow-up procedures for Naloxone. I think most importantly allows third-party administration by one who's not the patient and is not a health care provider. The Good Samaritan Law in 2015, that's Act 392, allows people to call 911 for overdose events and no criminal charges will be pressed if drug paraphernalia is found on the premises. Strengthening of our prescription monitoring program came in Act 110 in 2015 and it allows an unlimited number of delegates to access the prescription monitoring program. So for prescribers, people in offices, it no longer has to be just a physician or prescriber. They can assign other people in their office as delegates uh, once registered can access that program, obviously addressing the limited availability of time of the actual prescriber. Finally, I just want to list in Watson Standing Order Act 310 in this year, there's been an emergency rule in place since August of 2016, and the Louisiana Department of Hospitals is working on the details on this. So, Although it's already an emergency rule in place, uh, we're still working out who writes the standing order. Will that be Dr. E, will it be Dr. Gitchy, will it be somebody like me, Dr. Quee, who will write the standing order? We don't know quite yet, as far as I know. Uh, there's some more recent information on that, but that's part of what we're trying to work out. Uh, so I'm going to move on to federal grants. Uh, well, in the Office of Labor Health, we deal with a number of grants uh, and have so for substance use for some time. There are two I want to focus on that we received in the past couple of months. Number one is the medication assisted treatment prescription drug and opioid addiction grant. And that calls for uh, $1 million per year, up to $1 million a year for up to three years to expand our capacity for medication assisted treatment, wraparound services, and recovery supports for those with opioid use disorders. Um, we've, worked, we've worked with the state um, around the state in terms of looking at each of our districts to see who might partner with us, looking at the SAMHSA criteria for this grant. And we had to look at um, data like emergency room encounters related to opioid overdose, and patient utilization, admissions, opioid-related deaths. And while there are other areas of the state that have higher opioid-related deaths, we came down to looking at all the data, Metropolitan Human Service District uh, met the criteria, had the interest and capacity to partner with us for the grant. So we're partnering with them. Um, as we implement the grant, uh, lessons learned we can share with the rest of the state. And it's very possible, if you would like to, the federal government will come down with additional money to support a more uh, statewide expansion of the activities under this grant. The second grant I want to mention that we just recently obtained is a strategic prevention framework prescription drug abuse opioid grant. And again, while we've had strategic prevention framework Grant for substance use disorder in the past. This one focuses on opioids and provides for up to $371,000 a year for up to five years to raise awareness about dangers of sharing medications, uh, working with medical communities on the risks of over prescribing, increasing education to schools, parents, prescribers, and to patients. And the goal here is to reduce opioid use, misuse, uh, and raise awareness. So again, the focus is on opioids. And in this particular grant, we are working with uh, Jefferson Parish Human Service Authority. Uh, their coalition will be the target for our funding and grant efforts. And this one in particular, our first year, we'll be working with them, work out the details, learn some lessons. We will really be able to export and generalize the lessons learned statewide, uh, even under this current grant. So additional Louisiana efforts. Um, you guys may or may not know that we have 10 opioid treatment programs statewide. The Office of Labor Health oversees that. We have our State Opioid Treatment Authority, Tracy Perry, works with the Office of Labor Health, and we oversee all of those clinics. Uh, there are about 4,000 people currently enrolled in those clinics statewide. Uh, right now, the reimbursement for methadone in those clinics is cash, but we are working towards getting uh, Medicaid reimbursement for those uh, medications and services. Uh, secondly, I want to just mention our Centers for Medicaid and uh, Medicare Services Innovation Accelerator Program for Substance Use Disorder. This is a project that the federal government uh, through SAMHSA uh, sponsored. We were one of six states to uh, win an opportunity to work with uh, CMS on this. And 
And uh, our focus we chose was new male absence syndrome. A little bit over a year, year and a half ago we started that. And we've been working with um, other departments, offices, uh, local entities uh, like Women's Hospital, like Project Launch, like Acer, uh, a provider, substance use provider in the same area. Uh, and among other things, we put together a NAS toolkit. And our toolkit um, will be available shortly and provide information on uh, evidence-based practices for substance use for pregnant women and also provide uh, some resources in terms of who might be available to treat pregnant women or recently delivered women uh, in a given area of the state. Uh, finally, in terms of additional Louisiana efforts, I just want to mention the Opioid Commission. I think the first meeting was sometime in September. You can see on the slide here the various uh, subgroups or committees that are involved. So it's a pretty comprehensive look at opioid use disorder and looking at alternatives, making recommendations, uh, policy procedures, and any recommended legislation or other changes. For that. That's due in February. So hopefully, again, that will be something that will be a resource for everybody moving forward. So uh, moving on here real quick, uh, others um, have already talked about risk factors. These aren't the only risk factors. These are just some that kind of stood out to me. Um, and I uh, just wanted to mention that personal or family history of alcohol or substance use or misuse or dependence is a risk factor. Uh, younger age. In fact, the younger the age, the more risk there is for becoming dependent on opioids. Co-occurring psychiatric conditions, depression was mentioned, but other psychiatric conditions also increase your risk of becoming dependent or addicted to opioids. Psychotropic medications, also an associated risk factor. Pain, uh, impairment, chronic lower back pain, fibromyalgia, chronic shoulder pain, these types of things can cause uh, people to be at a higher risk for opioid dependence or addiction higher than usual past doses on pain meds. Dr. Roy talked about this a little bit, like a lot, on the CDC recommendations. This is just a, a reminder of that as well. So again, note that lower opioid exposure, so lower day supply, lower doses, lower potency, uh, all these are associated with decreased risk, and that's important to keep in mind. So a little bit about screening for opioid uh, risk. From my point of view, from conferences I've been to recently, some of the more interesting things I've seen, every emergency department, opioid prescriber, should dedicate some resource to screening, to education, and to brief intervention referral. Don't just talk about it, every policy and procedures. Include these as internal processes to assist in current patient education, screening, brief intervention, and referral. So have documents, have things to share with you, making a lock zone available to those on both A little bit more about some obvious recommendations about this. Post opioid flyers. I thought this was interesting. That in an emergency room, put your policy up there. Do your work, make your recommendations, put them on paper, and then post them so that people who are coming into the emergency room see that you are not going to refill lost prescriptions, that you're going to have a limit, maybe three days or whatever it is, in terms of what you are prescribed to pain meds. This is helpful for patient education. It may help divert people from crossing the threshold to begin with. And certain will help support your physicians and prescribers in the emergency room, giving them support they can point to the post. It's not all about their personal decision, but it's a hospital, emergency room, or practice policy. So provide opioid education to everyone. I don't think it's necessary to limit this to people who are getting uh, opioids or pain medication, because we know there's a lot of diversion. So make sure all your patients know about the risk factors and who's at risk. Maybe there's somebody else in their family that is at risk. Screen all patients. Provide brief interventions. Check the PMP database. Again, limit the amount prescribed. Take advantage of the alternatives. And counsel staff on stigma. This is a big issue. People don't like to talk about this. People feel somehow that people who are addicted are lesser or problem or antisocial or whatever. And I can tell you that uh, this is no, uh, in some ways, no different than other addictions or problems. Uh, Think about trying to lose weight and the stigma that we associate with opioids and cutting down on that versus cutting down on food and eating correct and doing good lifestyle changes. So think about that in that context. I do want to mention um, an app from SAMHSA, M-A-T-X uh, app here. It's a pretty good resource. It has a listing of all the uh, Suboxone uh, from providers in a given area and other guidelines on how to treat opioid addiction. Other resources and tools are available in there. It's a great app. 
and who would take home. Uh, overdose deaths have increased or drupled since 1999. We're above average in Louisiana. The rise in these deaths is directly linked to physician prescribing. So while pharmacological treatments like methadone, buprenorphine, and loxone are effective, the need fully outstrips our ability to provide those. The focus has to be on prevention. So uh, that's it. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Fontenot. I'm the Assistant Executive Director for the Louisiana Board of Pharmacy, and it is a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, with, with the Prescription Monitoring Program, there is often two acronyms used, PMD for Prescription Monitoring Program, or PDMD for Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. Depends on which state you're in. Mostly in this state, we use PMD. I'm often surprised to learn that many practitioners are unaware that there is a Louisiana law that imposes a mandate on prescribers of certain controlled substances to use the PMP under particular circumstances. I'm referring to Act 865 of the 2014 Louisiana Legislature. It basically states that a prescriber shall access the Louisiana PMP prior to initially prescribing any controlled substance listed in Schedule 2 to a patient for the treatment of non-cancer-related chronic or intractable pain. I can willing to bet that one out of every two physicians I speak with are unaware that the law even exists, even though it's been in effect since 2014. Getting into the PNP, uh, Act 676, like Dr. Hussey referred to earlier, of the 2006 legislation authorized the PNP. It's based on that drug system for the monitoring of controlled substances and drugs of concern that are dispensed in the state or to an address within the state. The electronic system is a PMP. It's a web-based system that collects and stores all controlled substances that have been dispensed in the state or to an address within the state. The goal of the PMP is to improve the state's ability to identify and inhibit the version of controlled substances and drugs of concern in a cost-effective manner that doesn't impede appropriate utilization. All Louisiana licensed pharmacies in or out of the state, which include mail order pharmacies, are required to report all controlled substance prescription transactions that schedules two through five narcotic and non-narcotic to the Louisiana PMP. Pharmacies are required to report no later than the next business day after the sending the prescription to the patient. Once the PMP receives the prescription data from the pharmacy, it generally takes about 24 to 48 hours to clean up and provide it available on the web page system. The Louisiana law has various categories of approved users for the PMP, but for today's purposes, I'm going to focus in on both prescribers and pharmacists. Prescribers and pharmacists can access the prescription monitoring program to look at their patient's controlled substance prescription history. The key word is there. It must be a patient of the prescriber, someone that has a legitimate practitioner-patient relationship. An additional feature of the PMD for prescribers is called a my or X function. It's basically a function in which the prescriber can go into the PMD and look at all controlled substance prescriptions that have been dispensed under his or her DEA registration number. It's a, it's a great tool to detect the diversion.
In this particular slide, I have a screenshot of the Louisiana Board of Pharmacy website. Our web address is www.pharmacy.la.gov. For those prescribers or pharmacists who do not have access to the PMP, they can go into our website, choose the um, prescription monitoring program link on the left side of the screen, and it will bring up a page on how to get access to the PMP. This is a screenshot of an actual PMP patient search page. You will notice on the right side of the page a column titled PMP Interconnect Search. By choosing a particular state or state in searching for your patient, the PMP Interconnect will return search results which include any controlled substances that the patient may have obtained in the selected state in addition to the Louisiana result, results all in one report. The Louisiana PMP currently has sharing agreements with 12 other state PMPs and we're going to be turning on several more in the near future. This is a uh, slide of a screenshot of the quick reference guide for tips and instructions on performing a PMP search. This can be found on the Board of Pharmacy website and I've also asked the webinar organizers to provide this document to all the PMPs. I took a screen up an analysis of the prescriptions that were uploaded into the PMP in 2015. In 2015, there were over 12,367,000 prescriptions that were reported to the PMP. So these are controlled substance prescriptions that were just being in the state or to an address within the state. We averaged just over 1 million programs on an average basis ever since the program began collecting data in June of 2008. For 2015, I broke that total number down into the top three categories, narcotics, sedatives, and stimulants. Narcotics being the highest, there were over 5.7 million narcotic prescriptions of the 12 million that were dispensed in 2015. Sedatives came in at number two with just over 3.8 million, and stimulants at just over 2 million. A further look at the narcotic prescriptions and broke those down by in ranking from one on, and hydrocodone prescriptions, to no surprise, we had over 2.5 million hydrocodone containing prescriptions to spend in 2015. In other words, one out of five prescriptions to spend in Louisiana in 2015 contained hydrocodone. Number two was tramadol, it is a synthetic opioid, but it has been a problem for many years. And number three was oxycodone containing prescriptions. This next slide represents the current utilization throughout the years of the PMP uh, by prescribers, pharmacists, and their relatives. Since the program began, there's been a steady increase in the utilization rates of PMP. In particular, between 2014 and 2015, we saw a 76% increase in the utilization rate. Uh, this is primarily due to You'll notice, in particular, looking at pharmacists, there was a 131% increase in utilization between those two years. And that was primarily because of the fact that a lot of retail chain drug stores mandated that their pharmacists use the PMP under certain, for certain prescriptions that they received. In that same year, we saw a 49% increase by the prescriber community in the number of searches that they performed. And I'll contribute back to the 2014 law that I referred to earlier, which mandated use. Currently, uh, looking at 2016, we're averaging right at 8,000 searches per day. And if we continue on that rate, it's about a 14% increase from year to year. <coughs> While those numbers look good when you're looking at the year-to-year -year percentages and the number of searches that were actually performed, this table represents the access and use that was done in the third quarter of 2016. The first column is the healthcare provider role. The second column represents the number of eligible persons who are eligible for PMP access in that healthcare provider role. The next column represents the number that were actually approved for access to the PMP. In other words, they went through the application process and obtained a username and password. The next column represents the actual number of users during that third quarter 
who were approved that actually went into the PMP and performed at least one search for a patient. And the last column represents the searches that were done during the third quarter by that healthcare role. So not to pick, not, I'll pick the first row of positions. There are, in the third quarter of 2016, there were 12,342 positions who could have, are eligible for access to the PMP. That's because they hold a state controlled substance license and a DEA registration number. The number who, are, who have actually applied for and been granted access of that number is 4,272, or 35% of the total. Of that number, those that actually who were approved for use, who actually performed a search in the third quarter of 2016, was in 2007. Less than half who were approved for use. And the number of searches that those 2070 positions made were 269,000, or about 35% of the searches made. There's a lot of debate going on right now whether or not the utilization of the PMP at this point is good enough. I'll leave that question to the answer by the way. And there's my contact information. If anyone has any questions or concerns, please email me and I'll be happy to respond. Thank you. So oh, thank you so much to all our guest speakers, Dr. Hussey, Dr. Roy, and Mr. Fontenot. This, I think, has been so useful on the provider level. These are practical tips, whether you can put up uh, the opioid policy in your ER, or these are the CDC recommendations, or how do you utilize the PMP. These are things that we, as real-world providers, can absolutely use them. So thank you so much for taking time on your busy day. And also a huge thank you to all the providers who are listening in online. I know we've reached maximum capacity, um, and uh, not everyone who wanted to participate is able to. We will email out the link to this recorded webinar as well as the presentation. Um, and we hope to continue this. So this is an inaugural series, and that we can have a uh, monthly lunch and learn to really help our providers. So thank you, everyone, for participating. Well, huge, huge thanks to Ms. Addie Heinzis for organizing all this on very short notice. Uh, so thank you, Addie. Yes, thank you.